You all know Alice and Tony, don't you? Alice went back to work at the beginning of November and Tony is now on paternity leave. He and I were WhatsApping a couple of weeks back when the US election was on and Tony said that he and Ted were busy watching CNN and pooling all they knew about American politics. I'm sure that Ted must have thought that Tony was making some of it up. Every now and then current affairs definitely seems much more weird than ancient history, like the story of Daniel in the Bible. Now, he was exiled to a foreign country, made to take elite training to be a government advisor. As far as we know, he spent his career in Babylon and saw several kings come and go. So it's not surprising that his book is stuffed full of thoughts about politics and the forces behind it. The first king Daniel served started out seriously paranoid and ended up with mental health issues. He was called Nebuchadnezzar. His word was law uh, and he would have taken to Twitter like a duck to water. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, you're fired. At that time, governments used dreams for advice on strategy, like the Pharaoh and Joseph story that we heard about last week. Nebuchadnezzar had some big dreams and uh, on one occasion he called in the scientific advisory group for emergencies. Yes, your majesty, tell us about it while we take some notes on our tablets. Not so fast, says Nebuchadnezzar, I've been caught like that before. If they know the dream, anyone could come up with a feasible interpretation. You tell me the dream first or I'll tweet about you. So there's a big panic. And at this point, Daniel was a junior member of SAGE, but he already knew the permanent secretary guy. And long story short, Daniel made a presentation that bullet pointed the king's dream in detail. Your majesty looked and there before you stood an enormous dazzling statue, awesome. The head was made of pure gold, his chest and arms of silver, his belly and thighs of bronze, his legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. By this time, the king was leaning forward on the edge of his seat. He'd found a new special advisor. Daniel goes on, a rock was cut out not, but not by human hands. It struck the feet of iron and clay. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold were all broken to pieces. The wind swept them away without trace, but the rock became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. The king was blown away as well. Daniel had totally established his credentials, but what did it mean? On the day, interpretation was straightforward. Nebuchadnezzar was part of a dynasty like the Tudors or Stuarts or the Windsors, if you're fans of the crown. But there was a general principle which stands the test of time and which points to every country and century since then. All structures, systems, governments, institutions have feet of clay. The dream was a warning against putting too much trust into any of them. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. It will crush all those kingdoms, but will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. Today is the day in the church year when we celebrate Christ the King, the rock whose kingdom grows and will never be destroyed. Next week we're going to start the Advent journey and in the dark of a Covid winter it's easy to limit our hopes to surviving rather than thriving. To sing only about from heaven you came, helpless babe, away in a manger, mild, obedient, and that's not always helpful in an anxious time when we're waiting on the government and the experts and key workers to do their best while we hope that we'll get the vaccine before too many more of us succumb. I have a lot of sympathy for government at the moment, but it is important not to expect too much from them. From almost the beginning, 
to very close to the end of the Bible, there's a healthy suspicion. There are low expectations of human institutions. So Paul says, I urge them, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Paul's best hope was that governments would not interfere with his religious liberty. Today, comparatively, we get a great deal after centuries of our institutions absorbing Christian values. And we recognise that in our intercession and thanksgiving. But there is going to be a time for the biggest ever celebration, waving flags, filling the streets with excitement, honking horns, going completely mad. That time is when the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Actually, for those of you who like fireworks, Karen and Rolf, Wendy and all you others, on that day when the 24 elders in Revelation press the button, there's going to be the mother of all displays, flashes of lightning, it says, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake and a severe hailstorm. Tickets are on sale now. On this last Sunday in the Christian year, just before Advent, we celebrate Christ the King and remind ourselves that Jesus didn't stay a helpless babe or suffering servant forever. The rock that broke off from the mountain will one day fill the whole earth, a kingdom which is even now growing. Sometimes you can see it, mostly in secret. So what are our takeaways today? Once we allow ourselves to think that all offers of hope in this season are the same, we become practical atheists. God is pushed to the edge. Hope built on sand is very different from hope built on rock. Be grateful to governments and scientists and to drug companies, to Dolly Parton and Bill Gates for investing in vaccines. Be, be very grateful, but don't accidentally give the impression to yourself or to anybody else that human initiative is a rock on which people can base long-lasting hope. All sorts of people are doing kindnesses and bringing short-term hope. Be appreciative of every kind word spoken into loneliness. But Daniel's message was that the tumbling rock is a challenge to anything less than the kingdom of Christ. Do kindnesses, hold people in the light, but pay attention to the light's intensity and heat and colour. When we say the name of Jesus over our offerings to India, our hampers for Wiltshire, or even over a playlist video that we think would encourage somebody we know, we could be acting on behalf of a whimpering infant who needs a cuddle. Or could, we could be sharing whatever little we've got with the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I'm so glad that Jesus humbled himself for 33 crucial years, but that was 33 years out of all of eternity. And I don't want to miss the big story. Our second takeaway, which should have come first, really, because without it, we don't get anywhere near the first one, is we need for ourselves to get back to basics and check that our hope is on the rock and not on something else, that our anchor will hold. You know the pentatonic song, Mary, don't you know? I really like the words and the tune, but it does get a bit passive aggressive about Mary. Mary, don't you know this? Mary, don't you know that? Mary, don't you know the other? Give the woman a break. She found out what was happening as she went along. I've got the whole story and still half the time I struggle to act as though it's true. Leave Mary alone and give yourself a working over 
for a moment, see how you like it. What the lyrics? Day spring, do we know that the baby boy is Lord of all creation? Do we know that that baby boy will one day rule the nations? Do you know that baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb? That the ickle baby Jesus is a great lamb? What the lyrics? The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the lame will leap, the dumb will speak the praises of the lamb. It's with the authority of Jesus, that Jesus, that we offer hope worth having. We declare it and who knows what will happen in somebody's heart as you reach out in whatever ever way you can. As the angel said to Mary, with God, nothing shall be impossible. Well, we need to put Pentatonix and their Christian albums on hold for a week or two, or we be bored of them by the middle of December. But we are going to sing again about Christ the King, our hope in this season and in every season, sunny or dark. In Christ alone, my hope is found. That tumbling rock that was cut off the mountain and reveals the weakness of human institutions and networks really has become the cornerstone our solid ground. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. That sounds like a hope worth offering. Abby and Mark. <laughs>